happening in the field really because we are we only have categorized a very few of the insects that are out there so what's happening to the rest of them now people have told us that bees are not native to north america uh, and when they say that they're really referring to the european honeybee but the honeybee has been native to us and there's evidence of it in the fossil records a lot of them did die out during the Ice Age and uh, came back in some ways. Both the Mayans as well as the Native in American Indians all talk about honeybees and actually show it in their freezers and their temples. And they used to collect honey. In fact, they still collected honey right up until 1990s in the Californian Peninsula when the last of the stingless honeybees went extinct. The European honeybee is also a leftover from the Ice Age. It wasn't the original bee in Europe, but it got cornered in some of the valleys and uh, lasted. And those we did bring to the United States, but there are just a few, uh, there's one of very many that are in the States. There are over 4,000 different bee species in North America that we know of currently. And the picture you'll see there just shows the size from a bit bigger than a quarter right down to something like just over a millimeter in size. So what are some of the facts for us? Well, we said 4,000 United States. There are over 800 currently in Texas. And I say climbing because two years ago, we only knew of 600. And then the uh, University of Texas in Austin did a, a survey trying to look for some more bees and found a whole lot, nearly 200 more bees during that one year that we did the survey in 2017. So the question is how many more are out there that we don't know? On average, we have about 232 different species in our local areas. Of all the species that are there, there's only one that stings. It's only the female that stings. And she only stings <laughs> the last two to three weeks of her life. But because of that, we are quite willing to exterminate all bees. It really makes sense. Bees are the only insect that provide food for humans in terms of both the honey as well as the pollen. And so it's important for us to really look after them as best as we possibly can by providing the environment for them to live in. So the picture there is an, of an oil bee. Now the oil bee is one that we found in 2017. We didn't know existed. I haven't seen any pictures. I'm just seeing Mark. Is anybody else seeing the, the picture? Yeah, Mark, do you have a, a presentation that you're sharing yes, up? Yes, I am. Then why can't you guys see the presentation? Do you have a share screen button? Yes. Oh, there. There. Ah, there we are. Brilliant. <laughs> Thank you. All right, we'll show you the pictures you missed and then I'll continue talking. So very quickly, that was the decline. There's a picture of the fossil. There's the large and the small bee. Oh, wow. Uh, there's the number of bees. And so we got down to talking about oil bees. So in the arid areas, the plants can't afford to use water for nectar because the water is very scarce and evaporates very quickly. So the plants have adapted to actually to make oil and they use nectar, which is based on oil. Well, the bees had to adapt to that. And now there's a whole series of bees, the species of bees that have learned to carry oil nectar and then convert that into honey. So they've adapted together. So are bees really our enemy? Well, we know that you've got twice more likely chance of dying from lightning than you are from a bee sting. And you have 470 times more likely to die from an auto accident than you are from a bee sting. In fact, the state actually records only one death from bee sting since 2000 in Texas. Now, what generally happens is a person gets stung, they panic, their body excretes a lot of adrenaline, they have weak organs, or they have something else wrong with them, and they actually die from that, not from the bee sting. You need about 100 bee stings per pound of body weight before it becomes toxic. So a bit like um, the COVID virus, if you've got a heart attack, but you've got a COVID virus antibody in you, they put you down as a COVID virus death. So that's what generally happens. But you know, it's been like this because fear sells and newspapers harp on fear because that's how they sell more newspapers. And so that's what's happened. Uh, I just need to get rid of, oh, I can't. So we really want people to help us plant for bees and most of the time it's native native plants we after because a lot of our bees are um, specifically feeders of native plants uh, the usda has estimated that if you do have bees pollinating in your either in your garden or in your crops that the yield increases by about 35 percent just because of having bees there 
So here are some pictures of some of the bees that we have. Uh, there are a dozen different species, but these are some of them we see more regularly around. Uh, there was the bumblebee we see quite often, so the carpenter bee. The sweat bee is one that I really do enjoy because they're very colorful. Um, they do land on you. They tickle when they land on you. The idea is not to swipe them uh, because they're solitary bees, and you kill that, and the whole nest just dies because there's nobody else to look after them. And then one the gardeners don't like is the leaf cutter bee because it cuts perfectly semicircular um, bits out of the leaves of your plants right on the edge and then carries it away for, it, for its nesting. So here is a, what I call a Texas feral bee. It's a honey bee. It's about half the size of the European bee. And it's la it landed on a little flower from a Texas native lettuce. And on the same flower a little later on, there was one of the smaller bees. So it gives you the idea of size of the bees. They get very small and becomes very difficult to identify them. So is the climate change affecting our bees? And the answer is absolutely. Uh, the behavior of the bees last year was really different to what it is this year. Uh, we, although we've had a lot of rain this year and some good wildflowers, uh, the rain has washed out the nectar and the bees don't have much food. Uh, usually by this time of the year, we have got all the honey we're going to get for the year and most of our bees haven't even started to pack away honey. This is an example of the brown belted uh, bumblebee that's sitting on this um, antelope thorn. Originally in the top picture, that was its range and it basically missed Texas. Well, this last year, we've actually got several sightings of it down even in San Antonio and even further south of us. So as you'll see in the bottom picture, that green area, that's the new range that's taken on because of the change in weather patterns that we have. So yes, it is affecting the pollinators. So do bees really work hard? Well, in order to produce a pound of honey, the bees have to visit 2 million flowers. The bees have to fly 55,000 miles, which is twice around the earth, to collect the pollen from those 2 million flowers. Each bee makes about a twelfth of a teaspoon of honey. And they can fly, our Texas native bee can fly up to about 10 miles from the hive. The European honey bee, which is what a lot of the commercial beekeepers use, has a range of up to about 0.8 uh, of a mile, a fraction of the distance. So as you already realize that the, our local feral bee has a lot larger range, which means there's better survivability down in Texas. Our particular area here in Texas is really short of food for bees. In fact, traditionally, we shouldn't have honey bees here because this is not enough food to sustain them. But because of human interference, we do have them. So bees pollinate a lot of the foods we like. So for us, it's you know, coffee, it's uh, cocoa for our um, chocolates cherries, uh, you know, figs. Some of the fruits or some of the um, things we like, like vanilla, for example, is only pollinated by the bee. And the only bee left in the world that pollinates vanilla is in Mexico. All the other vanilla plantations around the world are all hand pollinated because they've killed off the local bee that does the pollination. So we really depend on these little creatures for the quality of life that we have. I've got lots of little bits of facts in here. Um, I don't, as you probably realized when I did the presentations at the Earth Day, there were lots and lots of odd posters up to try and stimulate some discussion. But we always associate the hexagonal shape with the bees and people say, well, bees make hexagonal uh, comb. The truth is, no, they don't. They actually make circular comb. And the one on the left, the picture on the left is the circular comb. Bees work in circles. Uh, but as the wax in the comb dries, because of the surface tension, it pulls it into the hexagonal shape. So it's a bit of physics that take place there, but physics and chemistry that cause the hexagonal shape. It's not actually because of the, the bees. Another interesting thing about the bees is that they actually line the cell with a little bit of silk. The bees actually spin a tiny amount of silk to hold the pupa in place while it's busy pupating. The identification of bees generally is very difficult. Uh, some of the bees you can identify because of color or, sh or size and shape. Uh, some have some very particular characteristics on their body. But when we come to the honeybee, it's almost impossible to tell which species is which. And there are principally eight major species that come from Europe. Uh, we also have the hybrids that have developed here in our area, the Texas native bee. And just by looking at it, uh, apart from size, you can't really tell the difference. You either have to do a DNA analysis or if you take a map of the veins of the wings, every bee species has a different pattern on its wing. But you know, I battle to see the bees, so let alone I can't even see the pattern on the wings, so that's out. Mark, the important thing, 
Um, sorry to break in. I, I missed a question that somebody was trying to ask. Okay. Uh, they were asking if you can purchase native mason bees. Um, the answer is you can purchase mason bees. They're not native. They come from um, Oregon, up in that part of the world, uh, Washington State, Oregon area. Uh, we don't have native ones that are available locally, but you can purchase them locally. Uh, the supplier that I like to use is called Crown Bees. And they come in a packet and they, they come in their uh, cocoon and you just release them in spring after their flowers have started to, to bloom. If you release them too early, they will only pollinate on, they only feed off certain plants and they just die because the food is not there. So you've got to make sure that you have that available. Uh, they will mate to here, they will breed in this area and I've got some pictures later on of them doing that. Thanks. So in order to look after our environment and hopefully leave something for our kids in the future, we've got to consider the environment as a system. And unfortunately, this is not what the FDA does. The FDA considers things individually as unique entities that don't interact with each other. And we know from our science, from our physics, that as soon as you deal with chemistry or do with motions, there's interactions. Our environment is full of cogs that are all interconnected with each other. You upset one and the whole system goes in chaos for a while. And what we keep on saying to the people that do a lot to use a lot of insecticides is you're trying to kill off one particular species. But when you kill that species off, there's a gap that's left in the system. And what takes its place is something worse every time. So you cannot consider just one item, one flower, one insect or one part of the environment. You have to look at it as a whole and how the different things interact with each other. So I can't not give a presentation and not talk about the insecticides. Um, most of our insecticides are based off poisons that were developed in the Second World War to kill humans. So how good are they really in the, in the world? They keep on claiming to us, oh, they're natural, like the chrysanthemum one. They, they have, Terminix keeps on telling me that chrysanthemum is natural and that's what they use. Well, the question is, where in nature is it in that concentration? Nowhere. And we actually consume more of that then there's possible chrysanthemum plants in the world to produce. So no, it's not natural, it's synthetically developed. And when you produce something synthetically, you're only producing a part of the whole molecule, not the, not the complete molecule. In which case, what other impacts is it having? It's really reported that the chrysanthemum insecticide is carcinogenic. So we put that on our plants and our lawns, and then we let our pets and kids play on it, and then we start wondering why they get cancer. The, most of the insecticides are neurotoxins in some form, in which case what happens is it affects the, nearest, the uh, nerve system, the bee's ability to communicate. Um, and uh, so what happens is you'll see later on they can't, um, they can't move around. Now, a lot of insects will have what I call subbrains. They have the main brain in the head, which looks after the, the feelers, the sensors that pick up scent and sight. But then the abdomen and the thorax have its own center of processes, which do all the functions in that particular area. And what this neurotoxin is, it prevents those different functions from talking to each other. So then you find a bee that's trying to walk while it's flying, while it's trying to eat, and it just doesn't work. A lot of the insecticides are based on what they call a lethal 50% of lethal dose, which really is totally meaningless. What they've done is they've taken an old bee and tested it until it dies. What about the young bees? Are they not more susceptible? And the other thing they don't tell you is that they do that for a single visit. But we know that bees are visiting between 100 and 200 plants a day. So there's no such thing as single visit. Just on two visits, they've really got 100% of the lethal dosage. And for those that don't, they bring the toxin back into the hive. The hive's made of wax. The wax is a lipid. It absorbs these toxins. And the next thing you find, you've got a toxic hive and all the babies die inside there. So systemic insecticides are great for plants. They make the plants look absolutely wonderful because nothing eats the plant. But when we say systemic, it means in every part of that plant. It's in the nectar, it's in the pollen, it's on the leaves, it's in the stalk. And it doesn't matter what the insect is that goes and bites that stalk, eats the leaf or drinks the pollen or eats the, uh, the nectar of the pollen, it's going to take that lethal dosage back with us. I have questions about fungicides. Are they safe to use? And my answer is no, they're not, because bees use fungus to create something called bee bread, which is the food they feed their pupa and their um, young larva. So you put fungicides out, the bees pick it up, they take it back to the hive, and all of a sudden they can't produce bee bread, so their larva die. In broad spectrum insects just kill everything, which means you have an imbalance of, of your environment. 
which is not good at all. So the bottom line is we really want to stay away from as many of the insecticides as we possibly can. Uh, I saw this the other day and I thought it was great. I like to beware of the sides of March. You know, see the Ides of March, the poor old, was it Julius Caesar or whoever it is that died? Well, our insects die in huge quantities in March because that's when everybody is spraying and that's when all the young are born. So as I said, neonicotinoids affect the neurological system of the bees. So here's a map if you look at the picture. Uh, we, we want the bee to fly on the blue line. That's where it needs to go home. But when it was released, it followed the red line or the red and the orange line. It never got home because it forgot where it was because its brains had been destroyed by the, the um, insecticides. Now you put a, a strip of insecticide down and you put a cockroach go over it or a grasshopper or something like that. Once it's been across the other side, it, it's horrible to watch this thing just go into contortions all over the place. But somehow that's humane. So are there alternative insecticides or herbicides? Yes, there are. First of all, a balance or what we call multi-cropping. Don't have just one plant, have multiple plants in there. Have strips of wildflowers. If you've got a lot of weeds and we get rid of them, either cover them with cardboard or plastic, but one of the ways I like to do best is steam. To steam the weeds and they die off. Provide corridors for insects. Insects don't like flying over gaps to get to the next lot of plants or food. They prefer to fly along corridors. So provide corridors for them to get through. There are a lot of natural deterrents for bees, plants that you can use. And then the one that I promote a lot amongst the beekeepers is something called the integrated pest management. And I'll get to more of that later on. So another one of the questions that come up quite often is uh, what happens to a colony collapse? Well, it was something that was coined back in the 70s. And um, a lady called Dee Lusby was contracted by the FDA to go and investigate this. And she did a whole lot of interviews, in fact, over 100 interviews. I've got about 90 of these interviews to try and find out what's causing the bees to die. And her conclusion after 10 years of research was it's not just one aspect, it's a factor of aspects. And yes, poisons such as insecticide and fungicides are definitely up there. And monocropping was a big one. And she said, the more we monocrop, the worse the nutrition is for the bees, and hence they die. Bees won't touch GMO foods. So all these um, foods that we were modifying, the insects don't go to them. Uh, chemicals, antibiotics, and miticides that we feed the bees is, is having an impact. The one that we've been using recently for quite a long some time, we find actually sterilizes the male. And they want to know why is it the queens are not fertilized? Well, because the males are sterile because you're using these miticides in the hives. We also tried to upsize the bees. Now I was making them larger, but the theory is the bigger the farm animal is, the more productive it is. So we actually upsized the bee quite considerably, the, the European honeybee. And they wanted to know why were these things starting to die so often. And the issue was that uh, the bigger the insect, the worse the thermodynamic equilibrium becomes and the bee just can't survive. The bee's size, though that increased, the muscles didn't increase and the exoskeleton didn't increase, it stayed the same, which means now you're flying a jumbo jet on a Piper Cub air engine, it just doesn't work. And so the issue is to go back to what we refer to as the small cell or the feral size bee. And this is what um, Dee Lesby came in, and I think she's probably the, one of the most famous beekeepers we've got today that's still alive, where she said to go back to the natural size, and that's what our Texas feral bee is. It's a natural size bee. It's a very strong bee. Unfortunately, you have to learn a bit different way to keep it, to look after it. It doesn't tolerate um, careless beekeepers, which is why the commercial guys don't like it but it's totally immune to everything. So it's the one we want. If you look at the two pictures on the top right, you'll see one that's the, uh, it's actually Whole Foods um, supermarket. It's their fresh produce area. Uh, the second one just below it is all the foods moved away that are pollinated by bees. So your diet will have to shrink dramatically if we're gonna get rid of the bees. Another thing that I often go to is, uh, I go, went to one of the markets in, um, Camel County, Garden Ridge, actually, they, they had one up there by the municipality. And there were three beekeepers there at the table selling local honey. And I looked at this and I looked at these beekeepers and knowing Camel County and how very little food is in Camel County, I knew this wasn't correct. So I said to them, oh, are you selling local honey? Yes. Yeah. Is it local? Yes. So it's somewhere in Camel County. Oh, it's local honey. In Camel County? No, they wouldn't answer. Well, it turned out it wasn't even close to here. It was somewhere further south in Texas. It wasn't even local. The bees have been around since the dinosaur days. They've made their own medication and honey uh, formulation to suit that particular area they live in. 
and from area to area that varies. So if you really want real honey that's going to help you either with your um, allergies or you want to help you with your health, you need to get honey that's local to the area you live in. In other words, the hives are kept in that area. So honey is a sweet substance produced by bees. It's full of different enzymes and lipids and proteins that are important for us for that area. So raw honey is honey that hasn't been heated. Honey above 45 degrees centigrade or is about 100 degrees Fahrenheit destroys all the enzymes and basically you just have uh, colored sugar water. Most of the shops will not sell unpasteurized food because the lawyers have put hold of them and brainwashed them into saying that it has to happen. Well, honey actually doesn't go off. So you don't have to pasteurize honey because it's got its own ability to stay for years. But as soon as you pasteurize it, there's no goodness left in the honey. Uh, our buying population don't like honey that's clouded. So they will only buy honey that is clear, which means it's highly filtered, which means there's no pollen in it, there's no nutrients left in it. You, again, you just got colored sugar water. So the best honey is to get honey that is dark and thick and cloudy because then it's still got the original goodness in there. So pure honey has no additives in it. And uh, stores generally put an additive in it to prevent it from crystallization. Uh, honey from most of our wild plants crystallizes quite fast and within a couple of months. And crystallized honey is not doesn't honey hasn't gone off, it's just got crystals in it, which is actually quite nice. I enjoy that a lot. Uh, you put that through a liquidizer and you've got creamed honey and you people pay double for that. So don't throw it away. Just bring it along to me. Um, wax is a really important commodity in bees. It takes 10 pounds of honey to produce one pound of wax. And the bees produce wax from glands under its abdomen, as you see in that picture there. They've got uh, four glands on either side of the abdomen that produce these three small platelets of wax. They take their wax up into the mouth, then they knead it, and then they put it into their um, comb to build new comb. So integrated pest management has five sections to it. There's a biological section you need to consider. There's a cultural section, a physical section, and a chemical section, oh, four. I thought there was five. Okay, I stand corrected. So what these are is, first of all, you need to know about the pest you're actually looking at. It's life cycle, it's natural enemies, because quite often you can introduce an, in the, quite safely a natural enemy in that area or a plant that it doesn't like in order to get rid of it. Uh, the step two will look at the prevention side of these. That is looking at when you plant or when you rotate plants or when you water, um, how you're running your garden, and what other plants you've got in there that flowered certain times in order to be able to uh, destroy that particular pest. Observation, um, monitor what's going on. Uh, you know, not always are pests a problem. Sometimes you need a minimum amount, amount of them in there. Uh, but once they get above a certain threshold, then they become a problem either for the plant or for the insect. Intervention can be initially mechanical, which is some sort of filter or relocation. It can be biological by changing the plants in the area or bringing in its natural enemy. And as is a really last resort, you'll start looking at potentially using chemicals. Evaluate what you're doing and then repeat the whole exercise again. So when I say this, an ounce of prevention saves a pound of cure. Uh, some of the problems we have in this area is farmers, they spray, indiscriminately spray, although I must admit it has dropped off quite considerably over the last couple of years since Roundup has now been said as carcinogenic. Um, but putting barriers to prevent that spray from getting into your area where you have your plants is a good idea. Or, prov or otherwise provide, uh, planting plants in there that either provide a barrier to the water flow, because a lot of the insecticides are water soluble, uh, or a filter like a tree to prevent the particles from getting through. Are insecticides a problem for other things? Yes, here are the honey, uh, hummingbirds. You've probably seen this floating around on the internet the last couple of weeks or so. These birds have been poisoned, and a characteristic of that is that their tongues, they die with their tongues sticking out. It's the same thing that happens to bees. They've obviously picked up nectar from some plant that has either have a systemic insecticide already in the plant or was sprayed, and this is what happened to them. Uh, there are times we will see shade areas in the ground where the whole area has got a couple thousand bees that have died from spraying. Uh, Generally, if you're going to spray, if you're a home gardener, it's not, not a problem. But if you are on a farm and you're going to spray, you have to let the um, Texas Beekeepers um, FDA program know that. Uh, you've got to give beekeepers in the area tw uh, two weeks notice that you're going to spray. 
so that they got either can cover their hives or move the hives out and you're generally meant to spray at night or late afternoon when the bees are less are likely to be out foraging and you can spray you should be spraying only with that particular insecticide you cannot mix them unfortunately most of our commercial sprayers don't bother cleaning out their tanks and they quite happily mix things which gives us a big problem because they become more lethal so just a summary of some of the natural weed killers is that mulch is a good weed killer and no-till, uh, covered crops is a good one. Steam is my favorite. And they go to other exotics like electrical uh, ways of doing fatty acids. Uh, vinegar is another one I, I use ever so often. A high concentration of vinegar, at least 10% is a good one. Salt, but I don't know what it does to the ground, so I'm not terribly keen to use that. Uh, in spring, corn gluten prevents new seedlings from uh, uh, hatching. So that's, a, it's not hatching is the right word, what do you call it, uh, germinating. Soaps and oils will also destroy it, but it also destroys other things in the plant, in the ground. So bees have become our canaries of the environment. And why bees is because we manage them in hives, we can see what's going on, they're very sensitive to what's going on in the environment. The honeybee is easy for us to watch, whereas the native bees are very difficult for us to watch and monitor. So a lot of our native honey, our honeybees are now being used to determine how healthy is the environment. So an interesting fact, uh, we all thought that Velcro was a wonderful discovery and we humans were the inventors of it. Well, sorry to burst your bubble, but the bees were using Velcro thousands of years ago. So you've heard the bumblebee shouldn't fly because aerodynamically it can't. And yes, we're using two wings, separate wings, pairs of wings, it can't fly because it can't get enough lift. But they actually have Velcro hooks on the leading edge of the second wing that hook onto the forewing, which combines us all into one wing which gives it enough lift to be able to fly. So in the top pictures, you'll see some of the hooks there, just like Velcro, and the bottom picture of the electron microscopes are the same thing. How do bees fly? Well, the humming, let me kill that. Humming bees, when they fly, they are um, flapping their wings at about 200 times a second which is unbelievably fast. And they can do that because of two things. One is that the part of the brain that controls that is uniquely set into the thorax area, so it doesn't have to control anything else. Secondly is they don't have vessels in their body that feed blood to all the muscles to feed the oxygen to the muscle. Now, we breathe in air that goes to the lungs, so there's a time delay to the fusing of the lungs, or then the fuse into the, the blood, or then transfers around, the, transports around the, the body, and then infuses into the muscle. So there's a lot of delay for the oxygen to get to the muscle. The bees have vessels that, that take air directly to the muscle. So it, it puts oxygen directly into the muscle, which allows the muscle to oscillate a lot more faster than we can here as humans. And then the other aspect is not the muscle that's actually attached to the wing. The wing is attached to the thorax, which is in two parts, as shown in that picture. And then they have just two sets of muscles, a vertical section and a horizontal section that actually flex the body, which flexes the wing. So if I look at this graphic I've got here, that's what's happening to it. The bees actually bend their thorax, thorax exoskeleton, and that causes the wings to uh, flap. So is all lost with colony collapse and uh, poisons and things like that? No, the answer is not. Uh, we found that what we call natural cell, which is basically 4.9 millimeter or smaller size B, has the ability to cope with all the current diseases and uh, parasites that are existing for our bee population. Uh, they also can cope with the increased heat that we're having. And uh, fortunately for us, our Texas native bee is that way inclined. And we don't want to um, bring in other um, bees into the state. Our beekeeper was very clever a couple of years ago where he started putting uh, barriers to bringing bees into the Texas because the bees they brought in don't know our environment. They don't uh, breed up fast enough for our nectar flow. So they're constantly having to be fed and they're also very susceptible to the diseases. So you, if you hear anybody going for bees, tell them use local bees, don't use the imported uh, European honeybees. So they're best because they understand the microclimate and the uh, microclimate varies. So I've got five apries along from Petit through to Geronimo. Each one is totally different to the other in the way they've got to be managed and, what, and their health and what happens. The bees have learned because they're all locally bred, they're locally queened. They have learned the cycles in that environment and what plants are there and hence they are able to uh, adapt to that environment.
bees need water. They need water to cool the hive. So they evaporate the water to bring the temperature down. They can't digest honey on its own, so they have to dilute the honey to be able to digest it. So there are certain bees in the community whose sole job their whole life are water carriers. Now the bees have an interesting, as to come, let me not jump my gun and I'll come back to that. Um, what else can I tell you about bees? The bees make a product called propolis. Propolis is the bee medic medication. And what we have found is that propolis is a really good antibiotic or antimicrobial for anything related to the lungs, the sinuses, the bronchial work. And if you go over to Europe, uh, even to some places in Canada now, and you have any pneumonia or any problems with your chest, they will put you on breathing apparatus that actually takes the air from the beehives into your lungs to prevent that from happening. Um, so get back to the title. I put the title in for our, this presentation as uh, Bigger Buffet, Better Bees, because you can't keep feeding bees on fries, like we can't feed our kids on fries or carbohydrates. It's got to be a variety of food. And the more variety of food we have, the better it there is. What the FDA found, uh, along with a research program they did with Ohio State, is that just by allocating 10% of your cropland to native plants, in other words, strips on the side, it has an impact of increasing the number of pollinators by 350%, which means another 260 different insects can now live in that environment. And that's purely because of the quality of food. Many times when I go and do a post-mortem on dead beehives, uh, you'll find that the bee is badly, badly malnutrition. It hasn't grown the way it should do, and that's because it's a monocropping or it's been fed sugar water and it's not done any well. And the only way you can really get around it is by you guys getting more of your native plants out to the rest of us. So please keep that going. Uh, why is sugar syrups are bad for the bees? Well, if we look at the pollen, uh, look at the um, from you know, the pollen from the plants, it has protein in it, it has lipids in it, as well as carbohydrates. Whereas if you look at the sugar syrup, all it's got is carbohydrate and nothing else in it. It's not a complete diet for the bees. So bees know best of what to eat. And when a bee goes out, a honeybee goes out to, to pollinate in the morning, they make a mental decision. They're only going to pollinate a certain plant. So bees will not cross pollinate plants. Many of the other pollinators will like the moths and the bats and things like that will cross pollinate, but bees will not. They will only feed off one particular species of plant for that day. And they're only going to go to that plant if they see it in large enough quantities, a big enough clump, because it's very energy intensive to fly to a single plant, get a little bit of nectar off it, and then go and find the next plant. So if you're planting plants, plant them in clumps so that the bees see it's worthwhile to actually go to that clump. What we also found with the bees is that if they are lacking a particular nutrient, they will sort out that nutrient in nature and go and feed off it. So they, they love herbs, um, they love mushrooms, they like algae, uh, they like um, stale water because it's generally absorbed um, salts and things from the ground around it. And they will actually go and select out plants for, for something that they're lacking, a mineral or a vitamin that they're lacking, and they will feed on that until they get that back again. So if I look at this picture, this is of a comb inside one of the beehives. All the multicolored stuff in there is pollen. They've collected pollen from different plants, and we've got some uh, color coded uh, charts to tell us which plant they come from. Most of the time, they won't mix the pollens unless there's something that's really lacking, in which case, they will mix two pollens together to make up the, the correct balance of the food. So, if I look at the, the bees, you have certain bees whose sole job is just to look after inside the hive. The hive has to be kept very clean, as sterile, because it's, very, it's warm, it's moist, and a lot of nutrition there. So, it's very easy for microbes and bacteria to grow. So, the bees make sure that the forage bees, the bees that actually go out of the hive, don't ever come back into the hive. They can get on the bottom floor and the landing part of the hive, but they're not allowed to go up on the comb in order to keep it clean. So they actually have a certain bee at a certain age, whose sole job is to meet the forager, take the food off the forager, and then take it up into the hive. Now, there are certain bees will spend their time focusing on nectar. There are some bees will spend their time focusing on pollen. And there will be some bees whose sole job in their life is go and fetch and carry water. And they will pass that water on to an interior uh, bee that's inside, uh, one of the nurse bees, and that nurse bee will walk around the hive delivering water to where it's needed, either to cool a certain section of the hive or to mix with the honey or to feed to another bee that is thirsty. The bottom picture of the bees 
is showing the life cycle of a bee. So the bees are called your social. In other words, they do a job based on how old the bee is. So once a bee is born, for the first three days, her sole job is to clean. Then when she gets a bit older, she can then start doing some maintenance work and then she can start feeding the pupa and the larger bees. As she gets older than that, she starts producing pollen so she can start repairing the hive, uh, doing nursing. Then around about her third week, she can then start doing a defending of the hive. And then the last two weeks of her life, she goes out and does collect nectar. Her total lifespan in summer is five weeks and in winter it's three months. And bees will work themselves to death. And I'll show you a picture later, that, later on of that. So what can we do? We need to provide these corridors with clumps of plants for the bees to feed on and to follow through. We also need to provide undisturbed nesting areas for the bees. 85% of our native bees in Texas are ground dwellers. They live in the ground. And if your whole area is tilled, you're constantly destroying their homes in the ground and they're not gonna be able to, to nest to live there. We also need to make sure that we have food for them from spring right through until fall, not just in spring. What you can also do is help us with the outreach. Talk to as many people as you can. Talk about bees, particular HOAs. They are the worst. Uh, governments are not too bad. Municipalities are learning. But you know, most of the major cities in the US now all allow beekeeping because they realize bees are not the enemy. And they realize that they're important for the future of our, of our well-being. Eliminate pesticides. Uh, we don't want cosmetic gardens because they are great on catalogs and they're for houses, but most of us live in homes with our families, not houses. So we want to get away from these manicured lawns that are basically green deserts with carcinogenic chemicals in it. There are a lot of native uh, plants we can, we can uh, grow, grasses we can grow, and I'll get into one a little later on that I like. It's not just bees that I'm looking after. Our moths do an enormous amount of pollination at night. And uh, in a recent survey, they found that something like 45% uh, of the pollination was done by moths at night. So we've got to look after our moths as well. So in other words, switch off lights at night. Don't floodlit the gardens with lights. It just dis it distracts them. They can't go and feed and they go and fly into those lights. So we want to keep that away. Timing is everything. So certain bees get up at certain times of the day. So this plant that I've got here is, again, the Texas uh, native uh, lettuce plant. Um, it's the one that I got a threatening letter from the municipality and the HOA to remove from our garden because I said it was a weed. Uh, fortunately, we delayed them to get them to flower. So this plant flowers from sunrise to about 10 a.m. in the morning. The flowers then close up. So unless the bee is an early riser, it's not going to pollinate this plant. And then during the midday, the plant, the flower is closed, and then the afternoon, out come the seeds. So the European honeybee generally is a late riser. Uh, you want certain bees that get early. Now, the squash bee is a very good one for this because the squash bee is an early riser. And of course, we know squash plants have uh, plants, uh, flowers that bloom until about nine o'clock in the morning and then they die off the rest of the day. Also, we need bees with certain morphology. In other words, we need bees that either have long tongues to get down the tubular flowers. So this is an aloe. Or very short tongues, in which case they can go things like daisies or medium tongues. So here's, there's a milk thistle that's got some bees on it feeding. So depending on the plant to what the anatomy the bee is going to have in order to be able to get both the nectar as well as the pollen. So what else pollinates in our garden? It's moths, it's bats, flies, bees, ants, birds. They all have a finger to play in the pollination. Bumblebees are good to keep uh, because generally they only live in a local area of about 200 yards from where their nests are. They don't fly very far. They're really good pollinators, uh, better than honeybees actually, but there are very few of them. So honeybees win out because of numbers. They are intelligent. They learn to adapt to the flowers that are in there. Uh, they have long tongues so they can actually get to the bottom. And when they don't have long tongues, they've learned to bite through the side of the, of the flower to get the nectar. That doesn't help the pollination. They also have something called buzz pollination. Now, certain of our plants don't, uh, can, cannot be pollinated through touch or through rubbing against them. They actually have to shake the flower to get the pollen to float out, to form a cloud, to do the pollination. And bumblebees are the only ones who do it. And there's a list of plants that require buzz pollination in order to get pollinated. An interesting thing we found out recently is that there are certain plants now that have started to adapt themselves to the fact that we don't have enough pollinators. And so if the plant doesn't uh, get pollinated within three days, the flower deforms itself so it self-pollinates in order to try and get around that aspect. 
Um, what do bees see? They see something very different to us. Bees have a different spectrum. Uh, they can't see red, but they can see UV. So the top graph is the human. We can see right down to the red sector, but we can only see up to violet. The bees can see from yellow through to ultraviolet. So when they look at plants, they see something totally different. So on the left is what we see. There's a daisy plant, and then on the right is what the bees see. Again, on the left is what we see, on the right is what the bees see. Birds are the same, by the way, and a lot of our birds that are gray, put an ultraviolet light on them and you find that they're actually very colorful. So there's a dandelion under ultraviolet light. That's what the bees see, which is all sort of glowing spark sparkles to get them to come into the plant to get the nectar. When I see a, storm, a swarm of bees, what I do? Remain calm. Once they're in a swarm, a bee will not attack you because they've got nothing to defend. They have no babies. They have no food to defend. Then you're going to stay in that ball in the tree for about one and a half days, maximum three, because they can only carry three days of food with them. But within, usually within several hours, they found another place to go, and then they'll move into another hole somewhere else, particularly often our um, oak trees. And they're very good for the oak tree, by the way, because they chew out the bacteria that's, that's eat, rotting the inside of the tree. They then pack it with their propolis, which is an antimicrobial, which kills the bacteria and it makes the oak tree a lot stronger. So oak trees with bees in the center actually do a lot better than oak trees that don't have it. And of course, a swarm of bees is a beekeeper's dream because they're easy to get hold of and they're easy to house. Um, bees will find holes, generally three eighths of an inch is their ideal hole. So there's wind chimes at my front door and there's a carpenter bee that's moved in and made its nest there. And it's been there for the last four years now. Every year it comes back and makes nests in there and lays its uh, pupa and they stay there until spring and spring they'll pop out again. So there's a carpenter bee. Uh, it's got a bad name, it's got a bad reputation. It actually doesn't make the hole. It'll go into somebody else's hole and it might enlarge it, but it doesn't make the hole. Um, to deter the carpenter bee, you want to varnish the wood or cover the hole or paint it and it won't go in that area. So this one, don't worry about the text. The picture of the bee, the carbon to bee, look at its wing tips. They're chipped. Flying, at, you know, oscillating at 200 times a second. If it bangs into another leaf or another bee or some dirt in the air, it chips a piece of the wing off. And the bee will live until the wing can't lift it. So until it chips enough of the wing away where it doesn't get the lift and it can't fly, and then it dies. So there's some uh, solitary bees, which are, most of our bees are solitary bees. Goes into sticks makes a, its nest in there and lays an egg. There's a pack of um, grass, pieces of grass and bamboo for them to live in. That's a bumblebee nest, which is in the ground. It looks like little cocoons. So to make your landscape friendly, think of three dimensional. A tree is worth an acre of plants. So to have trees that have flowers on it or nectar on it or even honeydew on it would be great. Um, there's some nice guides put out by Texas Parks and Wildlife on native bees, how to identify them and how to um, prepare for them. Our ground nesting bees, as uh, so they make these holes in the ground. So if you see holes in the ground, just don't close it up. It's probably a bee that's sitting inside there. Um, your grass, I talked about grass. The grass I like is what I call the three inch grass. Uh, there are a lot of bees that live in the grass, native bees that are in the grass. So if you have a three inch grass and we have some native plants that are two inches in height, it's perfect for the bees. So try and cut your grass longer. There's a grass that's now been commercially sold called uh, Thundergrass, which is a three inch grass. It requires mowing about once a year and it's made out of three Texas native grasses. It's perfect for, for our lawns to use and it's drought tolerant and can grow in shade and sun. So it's got a bit of everything. So as a bee, you know, mind my saddlebags. I have a mission to go and pollinate and provide food for humans. Please make my environment friendly. Great, so that brings me up to the presentation. I think we have a couple of minutes for questions. Um, Mark, you had a, another question of, um, about native Texas bee species. Are there any that you would recommend for Comal County? Well, you know, there's a lot of bees in Comal County already. Uh, what I would suggest you do is rather just have um, 
provide an environment for the bees to live in. So areas of your garden, put away a certain area of your garden where you don't till, preferably in the shade where it's damp, uh, where you don't till at all. Leave some logs there to rot. Uh, when you cut down some of your plants, don't cut them right to the ground in fall. Leave the stalks up, particularly those that have hollow stalks, so the bees can get in there. There are enough bees that are floating around that are trying to find homes for us to go into. Uh, our feral bee is a good bee, but it's a defensive bee, so you know, don't really suggest it for populated areas. Um, mason bees and um, bumblebees are good because they generally stay in that area, but then you've got to have places for them to live in. The big mistake people make with bumblebees and mason bees is they definitely require a source of mud, soft mud, not sand, but mud within a very short distance of their hive or their, their not their hive, the area they're going to make for their home so they can carry the mud in there to seal it up. They, a lot of people will put them in their gardens, but they don't provide that constant supply of mud. Other questions? The grass I called is called thunder grass, like lightning and thunder. Yes. It's available from the American Native Seed Company in Kyle or Buddha, wherever it is. And what you can do is you can ask them to put in some small native uh, flowering plants for your particular area. And they'll mix that in with that seed and provide it for you. We have that and it's great. Good. Uh, I have a question. You were talking about local honey and, you know, getting the stuff from the local area. <laughs> where around here do we actually where can we get that? You said you, you'd been to a farmer's market and it wasn't really local? No, it wasn't. Um, the Texas Beekeepers Association run a, a website and on their website you can click on there and uh, ask for local honey and it'll tell you where, where local honey is available in your area. Uh, for Camel County, uh, Camel County doesn't really have enough natural food for bees. So most of the beehives in Camel County have to be fed uh, artificially for a while uh, to get the local honey. Uh, last year, I was fortunate the two apries I have in Camel County, both of them had enough wildflowers, and so we got a good honey crop from them last year. Um, I provide it. There's a guy in Marion who provides it, um, Blake Kirby, um, and I can get all these addresses for you and send it to you later on. Okay. Um, try, I actually don't know of another local, commercially available local honey producer in Camel County. You can get close to Guadalupe County, yes. Bear County, yes. Um, Camel's a bit of a dry area. Somewhere close, but not pinpointed, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, like okay. you, you, Bracken sometimes, <laughs> we've got a big oh. apiary of Bracken. They sometimes produce, and we think this year we'll get a good crop of Bracken, but it's not always like that. It's once every three or four years. Oh, okay. Thank you. There's a place in Sabine called the Gretchen Bee Ranch that claims to have local local honey from different counties. Do you know of them? Yes, I know them very well. Uh, you just mentioned the solution is from different counties. Not, not from Camel County. He does have some from Guadalupe County. So you need to ask him for the Guadalupe County honey or the Freer County honey. But each county, the honey is different in each county. It's a different flavor and a different makeup. So when you ask for local honey, you've got to specify the county you want the honey from. Okay, thank you. A friend of mine has some property in Guadalupe County and he's some, he's leasing out the land to a bee man. And he said that the man is using Africanized bees with a honeybee queen. All right, so Africanization. Um, all our bees, native bees in Texas, have African genetics in them. And that's the bee we want. For, that is the bee of the future, and that is the bee we want. It's very productive. It's a very strong, healthy bee. But it's a bee that doesn't tolerate dumb, stupid beekeepers. And unfortunately, we have a lot of those. It's a bee that also doesn't tolerate a lack of food. So if there's a lack of food in the area, they just pack the bags and they leave. They don't stay, which is why the commercial guys don't like it. I like them. All my bees are Africanized. I love it. They don't give me a problem at all. I take a lot of school kids into the hives. The kids manage the hives for me. We don't have a problem if you know how to treat them. As soon as you bring in a foreign queen in there, you've changed the genetics because the queen determines the genetics and they're no longer Africanized and they're no longer local. Oh, 
Okay, well, is the the bee keep, the bees are there because he has a gentleman organic farming vegetables mm -hmm. and things. So they're getting their food right right there at the where the bees are. Excellent. Yeah. So, so the, you're saying the Africanized bees are going to be become local because the queen is a regular honeybee? All our bees, native bees, are Africanized. Uh, all the bees I keep are Africanized, I believe. Uh, I have to get the DNA checked on it if that's the case, but they behave like that. Your queen has to be a local queen, not an imported queen. If she's imported, then you don't have the right genetics because she determines the genetics of the, of the hive. Uh, well, I didn't understand that part of it. <laughs> the um, imported queens last between six months and 12 months, no longer. Our local queens last up to seven years. So are these bees dangerous because they're Africanized? No, they're more efficient. So, More efficient. Yeah, so as I said to you, I take school kids. Uh, last week I had kids of uh, seven and eight in the, in the April working the hives with me. If you know how to treat them, they're fine. If you don't know how to treat them, they can become dangerous, like any wild animal. We have not domesticated bees. Uh, that we, 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 we basically bee havers. They, have, they live there because they want to live there, not because we control them. And so if, the thing about the African bee is, because it's more efficient, it doesn't send one or two bees or five bees out to go and sting you if you upset it. It'll send 50 bees to go and sting you. Uh, and it won't okay. just follow you for 20 yards or follow you for 200 yards. So that That's way... Great. <laughs> yeah. uh, but if you, if you don't mistreat them, they're not a problem. So I've been keeping they're them calm. for seven years, eight, nearly eight years now without a problem. Okay. Is there... Um an antidote for bee stings. Uh, I, I tend to have quite a good reaction to insect stings and my allergist was saying there's, you know, I've got an EpiPen, but other than that, they're telling me there's... Well, you see, the biggest problem with the bee sting is that people panic. And so what the EpiPen does, it suppresses your, your body's ability to, to generate adrenaline. And that's what it does. Uh, for a bee sting itself, what I use is I use bicarbonate soda or baking powder. Okay. And as soon as I get a sting, I wet my fingertip, dip it in the powder, and I rub it on, on the sting. And that takes the, the pain away, it takes the sweating away, and I don't react to it. Also, oh, okay. the sting doesn't attack you directly, it stimulates your immune system. So once you've had a certain number, for me it was eight stings. After my eighth sting, I stopped reacting to bee stings. Some people are sick, some are more. Uh, oh, really? It builds up, your resistance builds up to it. Now I know some of the old time beekeepers tell me that once they've got too many stings, they become sensitized to it. I've not had any medical advice to say that it is true or not. So I really don't know about that. So I use bicarbonate soda or uh, baking powder. Some people use toothpaste. I've never tried that. I know the bicarb does work. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Good to know. So a couple of questions you've got here is, do bees move often and how long do they stay in trees? They will stay in the tree as long as there's food in the area and they don't outgrow the hole they've got in. Bees will naturally swarm. It's the way of reproduction. So if there is enough food and they can build the colony up to, to a size, they will naturally break that, split that colony and one will fly off and the other one will stay. If that comb becomes too toxic because of chemicals, insecticides and things like that in the area or the area doesn't have enough food to support it, then the whole hive will leave and the tree, nothing will be in the tree. So bees generally move a lot in um, end of March, April, May, and then there's not much bee movement through until about August, September, we'll get some swarms, but a few small ones and then nothing again for the rest of the year. Several years ago, we had an infestation. Um, we would be sitting in our, our, our and watching TV and there would be a bee just flying around the room. And then I noticed um, later, just outside that room had a balcony on it and there were bees just everywhere. And we were having company that weekend. It was like, you know, you don't want bees swarming up the place that people were coming up to enter your house. So I called a beekeeper and he determined that they were in the walls 
everywhere, you know, the ceiling, the walls, whatever. And so he took care of that. I, we hated to kill the bees, but it was, they were just in the, the walls of the house and coming in the rooms. It, was that just an unusual situation or has it, 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 that could happen on a... So bees, bees living in the walls of homes is quite common, um, particularly because they can't find trees. So that's a nice area for them to go into. It's sheltered, it's cool, it's safe. So finding bees in, in the outer walls of homes or in the roof is, is common. Um, they'll have a small hole somewhere that they've been able to get into. So you need to bee-proof your house. So any hole that's more than three-eighths of an inch in size is fair game for a bee to go in there and go and live in there. Um, they like that double cavity of the wall. So if the double cavity is not filled, they will move into it if they can. When you move bees out of a wall, you have to take the comb as well, because if you don't take the comb, it melts. It gets other creditors that will come in there. It gets a bad smell because it going ferments. And then you get some more um, unwanted insects going into that area. So when you, when I do a wall removal, we have to make a hole in the wall big enough to get the comb out. Otherwise they, you're going to have a problem a couple of years down the line. Okay. Well, we moved shortly after that. So <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that occurred, but it was, just, yeah, so, it was just a really unusual situation. Yeah. And I didn't know if, if so bees, because we were new to the area and I didn't know if that was common or really. Bees communicate through scent. And if you have strong perfumes, uh, detergent smells, things like that, they come and investigate. They get very panicky because it, it blocks the ability to communicate with each other. And people that get stung generally have a lot of perfume around or a lot of strong scents around them. So you don't want that around. Uh, a lot of the uh, insect sprays you got to as mosquito repellents all have uh, things like a lemon balm in it uh, or a lemongrass. Uh, mm -hmm. Lemongrass is an attractor for the bees. Oh, really? Ah. Attracts them. You don't want to use that. Um, things like um, almond oil does repel almost all the insects get repelled by uh, almond oil. And that's generally what I use if I have to get bees for, from a particular area. Or well, they consistently want to come back to the same area, put a drop or two of almond oil in that area, and they don't, they don't come back again. Okay. Well, they had told me it was just that they were looking for a new home and found it there. Yeah. <laughs> Lucky me. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Hey, Mark. Uh, um, I thought my parents and my peers have taught me about the birds and the bees, but every second sentence you had you educated me on bees thank you very much <laughs> yes. really pleasure yeah. learn yeah. more in the last 90 minutes than i did in my first 65 years yeah. right yeah this was wonderful each of those Great. slides could be a, an hour presentation on their own <laughs> right i'm sure <laughs> wonderful thank you so the question there's another question here do bees go dormant during winter our solitary bees do they hibernate the solitary bee will come out, the queen usually comes out, it produces um, it mates, uh, it produces its eggs, the eggs will then pupate, and then, they go, then they'll hibernate until their particular plant flowers. So our native plant bee, our native uh, bees will only come out when their particular plant that they, they specialize on flowers. And if that plant doesn't flower that year, that bee doesn't come out that year. And that's the one issue when you get bees like mason bees and carpenter bees and uh, bumblebees, is people tend to release them before their food source is available. The honeybee, however, does not hibernate. The honeybee stays active throughout the year. Uh, it, goes, it can go into something which we call a torpor, which is a very, it slows its body down because the temperature has dropped. But generally a honeybee will keep its body temperature and the hive at about 85 degrees, doesn't matter what the temperature outside is. And if, um, if it's exposed, it'll burn up a lot of energy, which often happens and the bees then starve during winter. They haven't been able to store enough honey or the beekeeper's been too greedy and taken too much of it. So the honeybee doesn't uh, pupate or doesn't go dormant in winter, but the um, native bees will. There's one on there about a big bumblebee drilling a hole too. 
Oh, yeah. you see that one? Yes, I see that. And it talks about half an inch hole, which is really a big hole. So either it's a, a carbon to be more than a bumblebee is going to have that hole that big. But what it'll do is it, it drills a tunnel. It t goes to an existing hole and widens itself, makes a tunnel. And then in that tunnel, it'll lay usually around about five to eight separate eggs in there, each with its own little cell. And when it's finished doing that and it seals up the outside, it then goes, flies off and either makes another one if it can still live long enough or goes and dies. So uh, what can you do about that? Um, well, the only thing you can do is seal it up at some stage. So uh, if you really want, if you want the bees to survive, then I wait until spring until you see that the little mud covering in that hole is broken. And once that mud hole is broken, you know the rest of the bees have come out. And then you've got to fill that hole either with cement or foam or something to prevent the bee from going back in there again. Will they come back to that same hole? They will try and come back to the same hole, yes. Okay. Until the hole gets toxic or too small for them. And once they determine that it's too toxic for them, then they won't come back there again. But I, haven't, other... I haven't seen the eggs yet, but boy, he's working on that hole and I can stick my little finger in there. It's huge mm. and it's a hard wood. So what, if you don't want him there, what I would suggest you do is just put a bit of um, almond oil, get a, little, a small bottle of essential oils, or almond oil, and put a drop near that hole or at the entrance of the hole. Whatever's in there will stay in there, and then she won't go back into laying any more eggs in there. Thank you. So the murderous hornet. Well, you see, what's happened is, um, you know, the government severed the connection with the press, the press had nothing to report on. So then came COVID, vi COVID virus, and that was a wonderful fear factor. So we had a huge amount of press because of this fear about a virus that kills something like a tenth of the people that flu does every year, but that's another story. But then people are starting to see through what's happening in the press. The press had to find something else, and there's somebody heard about something about a murderous or a giant hornet. And now we're having all this press about panic, and everybody's trying to get uh, research funds to find an antidote for this hornet. The bottom line is the uh, Zero Society reported at their webcast um, webinar this week was only two of these hornets have ever been found in North America. So what's the big deal? Secondly is these hornets have been here before. There's records of them being here before. And then they find <laughs> out and now they're coming back or maybe coming back to it. They live in Asia. The Asian bees have got it under control. The Asians have got an antidote to it already. So why are we having to do all this research on something we already know the answer to? It's just another way to sell more press. So don't worry about it. They live in high altitude forested areas, so they won't come to Texas. They might go to the Rockies if they ever do come here. Um, but they haven't found a mating pair. They've only found two so far, and both were dead. Cool. All right. Thank you, Mark. Thanks, Mark. That, was, that was wonderful. We really appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. Yes, thank you. That was great. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Well, I enjoy dealing with the Native Plant Society. I so say you guys feed my bees and I enjoy your Earth Day when yeah. you have it. <laughs> and when, we, when we do have it, yes. <laughs> That's right. Well, Mark, stay tuned. The presentations you've ever had. Incredible. <laughs> thank yeah. you. Thank you. Pleasure. All right. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, and we could see everything because it was up close. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, nobody had problems seeing your or hearing. Seeing all, yeah, seeing all the slides. Or hearing, right? Mm -hmm. Thanks. Bye. 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 Goodbye. Thanks for doing. Thanks Thank for doing you, this, everybody. Oh, my pleasure. I'm glad it all worked out. I'm glad y'all. Yeah. Showed. Thank you. All right. Sure. Good to see everybody. Yep. It sure was. All right, Mark. <laughs> well. Again, really appreciate you doing this, and it was wonderful. Um, I'm sure we'll be in touch, and hopefully we'll have you do another presentation sometime soon. Good. All right, then. Thanks, so, everyone. Thank Good much. night. All right, I'll go ahead and close thank this you. out, then. Good seeing you again, Carol Wilson.